Hey guys. So my talk will be about measuring operational quality of recommendations. So what do I mean by that? Let's say you have a recommender. Um, this is an article detail page and it serves you some recommendations. Let's also say every night you update your model. For example, you upload some new weights. What is actually happening to the quality of the recommendations that you deliver when you update the model? And can you tell online? Can you tell what happens to the quality in production when things around the model actually change? And can you alert on this in real time? This will be the topic of my talk today. So who am I? I'm a research engineer. I work at Salando. Probably some of you won't know it. It's a big European company, really big, 5 billion euros on sale every year. And I work at the recommendation algorithms team, and we develop scalable machine learning products. So this will be the outline of my talk. First, I will show you a bit more about the problem. Why is it actually a problem? And what risks are we running in production about the quality of what we deliver to our customers? And then I will show you a proposed solution that I developed and how I implemented this in my team and some examples that we learned, what we learned from it. So let's deep, a bit, deep dive a bit into the problem. So how do we currently monitor algorithmic services? Well, mostly like any other service, we focus on speed and we focus on errors that occur during the processing of our recommendation. So basically latency and availability. So here you see a few tools. Probably some of you already use those tools that are pretty good. You can see them in any operational book, and, but they're not enough. So just answering successfully doesn't tell us that it was a good answer. In contrast, to just give you another example where this is the case, let's say you want to update a database record and you get back an HTTP 200, then you can be fairly certain that you just updated successfully this database entry. However, for recommendations, this is not the case. And I will now show you why and show you a few risk areas. So here you see a schematic overview, what can be a flow of when you call a recommendation engine. So let's say you have a client and they request recommendation from your recommendation service. The service has code that serves the model and it also has some configuration around it, for example, for business rules to post filter your recommendations. Typical use cases are that you want to have some additional logic, like filtering by brands or only showing discounted articles, or just you want to filter only articles that are available. Typically, you also call external services during the processing of your recommendation during the creation, for example, an article metadata service. There's also a batch part, usually, where you learn um, a new model and you update it. So this is the theoretical flow. So what could possibly go wrong? And the next examples that I will tell you are actually from my practice at this job or previous jobs. I will not disclose. <laughs> OK. So let's say the client makes a request. What can go wrong here? Let's say one of the apps, let's say the iOS apps, releases a bug where they lowercase a case-sensitive identifier. You will not see this bug on a per-request level because it's completely legal to have an all lowercase user identifier. However, suddenly the model is not going to be able to find those users, but you will only see this bug in degradation of quality on the aggregate of, your, of all your responses, not on the individual level. So this is very hard to detect. Another risk area is actually your own code. You might release a bug. Let's say it was a copy and paste error, and instead of pointing to one model, you're suddenly pointing to another model, maybe a similar one. This is also very hard to recognize. Third risk area would be the model yourself. Maybe you have a problem during the training. You have an inferior model one day, or maybe you only uploaded part of the weights because the model updating job was not properly monitored, and suddenly this day your users get really bad recommendation. Would you notice that? Another problem is external services. Maybe you switch from one metadata service to another metadata service and you want to know if this impacts your quality. Or maybe you use a field from this metadata service and it used to be populated in 80% of the cases, but it degrades over time and you think you deliver this service successfully, but over time the data is less and less filled and suddenly only 40% are available and your quality suffers because you filter based on this field. This has to do nothing with your model, but many of those factors actually substantially affect your quality 
and so you would want to know about it because that's what you deliver to your customers. And last but not least, configuration is also a risk area that impacts your quality. Someone might apply an overly strict filter or maybe your configuration worked fine during the non-sales season, but when you move into sales season and some, your data distribution basically changes, so does um, your quality of your response. So as you can see, there are many things that can go wrong, and since it's software development, they will go wrong, and current monitoring is not covering that. So what can we do about it? Um, I will now propose you um, a solution that I implemented in my team. So let's talk about the definition of response quality. Typically in microservices we say it has to be, or in actually any software we say it has to be fast enough and there have to be no HTTP errors. Then we consider it a successful response. I suggest that we redefine that and say it still has to be fast enough, but also it has to be successful according to your business case, whatever that is. So to give you one more concrete example, let's say you are serving personalized recommendations on the home page of your company, and typically in the old world you would say you want more than 95% of those to be HTTP 200 and in under 200 milliseconds. But that also covers, for example, empty responses, and we would all agree that this is not a successful recommendation, right? So let's redefine it a bit and say from that personalized model that you serve there, you want at least four articles because you know four are in the viewport for most users. And since it's personalized, you can't go for 95, mostly. Let's say on the web, it's like 65, for example, that's your target. And you also want them to be in under 200 milliseconds. That's already more concrete. So how can you come up with such metrics for your business case? Well, as I said, it really depends on your case. So maybe you have advanced capabilities and your model has confidence scores, so you might be able to pick a metric that is more specific than what I just introduced. But it really depends. Um, you have to choose your own. Most likely, you're not going to be able to capture the objective quality or the one that the user perceives. But the good news is that if you go for a heuristic that comes a bit closer than what we currently have, it's already a really useful tool. I have some criteria that I suggest on how to pick a quality metric to monitor. It should be comparable across models, so you can switch different models and see how the quality behaves. So don't choose anything that you can only um, get for the specific model that you use. It should be simple and easy to understand. So I want all of your developers, you, and also your product to understand what you're going for there and what this level is. And it should be collected in real time. So you can immediately see if something starts going wrong. Also, don't, um, also do choose something that allows you to do actionable alerting. Um, to give a counter example, if you included return rate for articles that you sell, this would be with a huge time lag. Then you would be wondering what went wrong four weeks ago. That's not what we want. We want to measure exactly when you, at the point where you return to your users. So pick something like that. So those are a few guidelines that you can go by. So what did we actually do in my team? Um, we're the recommendation team of Zalando. Um, we have dozens of bis business cases for the website, for the apps, and also in emails. And um, we have actually a really high load, up to 4,000 requests per second, and quite low latency requirements. Next, I will explain to you what metric I chose. But for that, you need to get a bit of background. So as I said, it will be always business case dependent. In our case, our recommendations are created from a sequence of configurations, where each configuration is a model, and some filtering rules. And when the request comes in, let's say, give me 10 recommendations, we try the first model and the filters. If this doesn't give us 10, we go to the next model and so on, so we either have enough recommendations or we run out of configurations to try and then we return. So I picked a very simple quality metric and I said, um, in how many cases do the five first articles come from the best configuration? And what is also a very interesting quality metric is don't only look at the users that you serve very well, also look at the users that have a dreadful experience with your service. So I'm also looking at the really bad experiences and I made a definition that if we have less than five or the top five 
articles contain a bad fallback. In our case, we often show popular articles, for example, then we would consider this a poor experience. So if you have your quality metrics defined, as I, again, as I said, business case specific, those are ours, you can then can do implementation. I wanted to give you a feeling how difficult it is to integrate such quality metrics, and in our case, in, as, as well as in most of your cases, it was quite simple. So this is, um, again, a schematic view. You have a bunch of servers, and on each server, um, you get the request, and on request level, I have this definition, what I consider good, and I just have counters there. So you can take any counters library that just counts up when it's a good response, a poor response, or all responses. And then there's um, a monitoring tool, which is typically available in most companies that have multiple servers. And this monitoring tool, just if you're not doing it yourself, talk to your engineering department. They already query all of the server instances to get um, metrics. And that's just one call more. And um, this tool then queries each instance, and you calculate the percentages across all uh, servers, and then you also do the alerting based on that. Then you have a visualization tool. In our case, we have Grafana. And the monitoring tool is actually an open source solution from Zalando itself. It's called Zmon, if you want to try it out. So how does alerting look like? You can drop down any of our business cases, and you can see live in real time how many good responses we have and how many poor responses, and you can alert on that. And for your important business use cases, you can analyze, get a feeling if you have potential maybe to improve one or two, or maybe you want to reduce the bad experiences. For example, here you can see it over time, so if you want to deep dive into one of your um, use cases, what's happening there. Okay, last tool I want to show you is the deployment monitoring. Um, for those of you who come from academia, I will briefly explain to you how the deployment works. So typically when you deploy a new feature, it's not active yet. So you uh, deploy, you add the code, you deploy the new application, but it's not, the feature is not live yet, you switch it on later. That means that the new version of the software and the old version of the software are completely identical and should have the same behavior, same model, same weight, same everything. So essentially this is an AA test when we think about it from a scientist perspective. So I measure the old stack and I measure the new stack and I do the difference between the two. So to give you an example, let's say use case Y has a percentage of 80% good responses on the old stack and 79% on the new stack. I would record this as minus one. And I do this each minute during the deployment and I would, ex this is a distribution, and I would expect this distribution to have an average of zero if we didn't introduce a bug. So quality basically should be exactly the same. And this is how, when, how we can detect bugs in our own application. So basically the risk area of our own code and find out if we introduced any bug around the model. So this is what this looks like. Ideally, of course, we would want to have a box plot because it's a distribution, but we can use existing tooling, which usually shows everything as a time series. So those are each line you see here is a use case, and all the lines are roughly around zero, which means we didn't introduce a bug. So this is the difference between the, the two stacks. Some are a bit more noisy, as you can see. Those have a bit less traffic, so you can, you can get the feeling. And if one of the lines is substantially below zero most of the time, this is when we introduce the bug, and it means on the new stack, somehow this use case is much worse than on the old stack, so we need to roll back and find out what happened. This is the last tool I wanted to show you, and now to sum up what, um, what I just said. So basically, I would argue that all data-driven services must include real-time data quality monitoring, but the definition of what you consider as a quality metric and what is an acceptable level to you is, will be dependent on your business case. However, as I demonstrated, you can pick a relatively simple quality metric and it will already be very useful for you. Those quality metrics will you allow, allow you to get a real-time measurement of what you currently deliver to your users and it will detect all of those problems that I showed you earlier that are really hard to spot with normal monitoring because you will not see them on a per request level, only on the aggregate. 
And the good news is this is very easy to integrate with existing tooling that you already have in your company most likely, so no new additions needed. And as a side benefit, you will also can use it to reason with your stakeholders about the expected service of your quality. So for example, many stakeholders are surprised when you tell them this personalized recommender only gives you personalization in 65% of your requests. So then they think differently, oh, what do I show actually the other 35% of the requests? So, and this is also quite useful. Um, to sum up, this was my talk. And also, um, I'm actually looking for um, a principal research engineer in my team who shapes the future algorithmic core work of our team. So both if you're interested in machine learning DevOps and if you want to talk about the models or the position, um, talk to me in the break. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, just talking to someone that's been on call a, a bunch for okay. similar things before, um, I was wondering how do you deal with reducing false positives? Because there's nothing really worse than being alerted at say three in the morning that something's gone wrong. You wake up, uh, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. then it's you know a, you know a false alarm. And and if from my experience, if that happens too much, then you don't you, you tend to not trust the alerting system as much, and maybe just turn your phone on to silent. And yeah, yeah, yeah. First, you need to get a feeling how your time series behaves over time. If it's very eradicate, then it's probably not a good metric. It should be a bit noisy because it's, um, it's, we all know the data is more volatile than if you have something very deterministic. So you, you make a mixed approach. You, you look for a good metric, you try to understand it over time, how it behaves, and then you alert usually um, a bit coarser, so only like on, on bigger drops. And I wouldn't necessarily call someone uh, at night for a 5% drop, right? <laughs> yeah. Excellent, thank you. Good question. Okay, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you.